And an important addition to the English department at Casper is Dr. Ariel Zebrak, who earned her PhD in uh, 2013 and arrived at UWC in 2014 as a new assistant professor in English Lit. She quickly established herself among her students and among her faculty colleagues as a dynamic and energetic force who's been creating new opportunities for her students. This was clear not just to her students on campus in Casper, but to students who took courses from her via outreach and to her colleagues both in Casper and in Laramie. Um, her courses are fun and exciting. Uh, she produces excellent students. She has a way of encouraging students to do their best. Uh, one of those tricks that all faculty wish they, they had at their tip, but um, only a few uh, faculty actually do. Um, already in 2017, just three years after she was hired, she earned uh, extraordinary merit in teaching from the university. At Casper, she's also founded a branch of the Honors Program, joining UW Casper students to the new Honors College in Laramie. Now, on the one hand, you could say that she's a typical academic and publishing the standard kinds of things that academics publish. Um, here's a couple of uh, titles of articles that I like, Riding Behind the Curtain, uh, Rebecca Harding Davis and Celebrity Reform, obviously coming in to a little bit of uh, modern mix there, Intolerance, A Survival Guide, Heteronormative Cultural Function, and Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Um, she's edited a collection of, even, of articles on Edith Morton's uh, the Age of in Innocence, uh, and, um, but what I'd like to point out is that academics don't just do academic stuff. Uh, we have something like Saturday Week where we try to bring out uh, some of the things that we study and the knowledge that we've gained and the analysis that we've done to the public. Uh, Ariel is going to join us to do that in a moment, but she also does this on a regular basis. Uh, she writes, um, a scholarly perspective for a popular audience. Uh, many things have occurred up here online at the Toast. Um, on Amish time, how to tell if you're in a Henry James novel. The Trump train is actually a Trump plane. And my favorite, Edith Wharton reviews the Starbucks located at the childhood home on West 23rd Street. Um, with that, tongue in cheek, let me introduce Professor. Thanks, Paul, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you all for being here tonight, um, and and thank you for for having me. It's wonderful to be in Gillette. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the American problem. Obviously, there are many American problems. Um, but I'm going to take you a little bit back in time to the beginning of the 20th century um, to help us think through an issue uh, that was at play at that time via one of um, the most important but very little recognized figures uh, of that period. Um, and that is a man named James Weldon Johnson. Um, Sometimes when historians of the Harlem Renaissance talk about him, they call him an architect of the Renaissance or an author of the Renaissance. I like to think of him as a theorist of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he participated in what happened during that period in a lot of different ways that I will talk with you about tonight. Um, now, when we think about the Harlem Renaissance, we probably think about jazz. Uh, and that was a huge part of the arts um, scene that emerged out of about a four mile square um, area in Upper Manhattan. Um, but the cultural influence of this movement was enormous, and it wasn't just throughout America, uh, but throughout the entirety of the um, globe, really. Um, Harlem Renaissance innovations were very popular in Europe, um, in Africa, in South America, um, and especially in Paris, um, which was sort of had a twinned movement at the same time. Um, but it was not only a movement of arts, it was also a movement of politics. So uh, here you see um, the Universal Negro Improvement Association holding um, a political event. It was also the time period when the NAACP um, 
the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People was founded. Um, and the civil rights movement that we associate with the 1960s really started to gain momentum uh, during this particular period through the mixed cultural and artistic efforts of this movement that we think about as the Harlem Renaissance. Um, so my area of research is late 19th century and early 20th century <coughs> literature. And I study all kinds of literature, um, not just African American literature, British literature, um, different kinds of American literature. Uh, the main issue that I'm interested in is this intersection between artistic culture, um, culture of the visual arts, the culture of the performing arts, the culture of literature, and politics. What do the two have to do with each other? What, if anything, can they teach us about one another? The reason why I became so interested in the Harlem Renaissance is because this is an issue that African American authors were dealing with in a very serious way during this period. Because they were, on the one hand, facing a political emergency, but on the other hand, trying to negotiate the emergence of the African American literary tradition and how they wanted to frame that and think about that, um, not only as a historical legacy um, looking back, but also moving forward. So there was an enormous amount of African American literature in this country, um, really almost from the beginning. But during the 19th century, the most popular form of African American literature was the slave narrative. And these were texts that were produced by the abolitionist movement for the most part, um, but they were also best-selling entertainments. So um, slave narratives followed a very formulaic pattern, which as I'm sure you could imagine, the central thrust of it is the story of how the slave became liberated. So it starts with their birth in slavery. Um, and then a really important part of every slave narrative is how the slave teaches him or herself to read um, and to write. And then how they became free. And they would um, go through many different adventures um, and mishaps on that path to freedom, um, making it a very entertaining kind of story. Um, the problem with the slave narrative as um, a form is that it was almost always published by a white editor um, or um, sometimes even rewritten by a white author. So the slide we were just looking at was Frederick Douglass, the best-selling um, slave narrative of the 19th century. But there were countless slave narratives during the 19th century. And here's a couple more. Um, you could see here Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, edited by Lydia Mariah Child. Um, Father Henson's story with an introduction by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Child and Stowe were two uh, very prominent, best-selling white authors who found these slave narratives and published them. And even though they were written by the slaves whose lives they were about, in the eyes of the public, they were very much seen as uh, white literary products that were composed of African-American lives. Um, so they weren't really thought of as African-American artistic inventions, but instead as African-American experiences which were shaped into an artistic form by white editors. Um, that's a problem if you're trying to form a African-American literature, you're an African-American author, and you want to think about how do we conceptualize our literary history in this country, well, you can't claim a tradition that's already been claimed by someone else. So in this moment of the late 19th century, early 20th century, this is a problem that African-American authors were facing. At the same time, they had an arguably even bigger problem to contend with, and that's the problem that was at the time known as the Negro problem or the race problem, but usually referred to as the Negro problem, which is not a great thing to call it because, of course, it's not a problem that was authored by African Americans. Um, this is a circumstance that they were forced into by violence that was um, asserted upon them. Um, James Baldwin talked about this problem, who's a, a later 20th century writer, um, as a problem that was really created by the people who think of themselves as white. Um, and James Weldon Johnson, the theorist who we're going to think about the most tonight, um, said the problem, which is commonly called the Negro problem, is in fact the American problem. Meaning not only that it was the most significant problem facing America at that time, but that it was a problem that affected all Americans. It was not a problem that just belonged to black people. So faith, thinking about those two problems, the problem of how do we create an African-American literature, 
and the problem of how do we solve this problem which is attributed to African Americans but not created by them, these are the two problems that African American writers were facing at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the autobiography, the non-fictional autobiography written by himself of James Weldon Johnson. Um, I highly recommend this book. It's not one that many people read or that is very often assigned. It's quite long, but it is so enthralling and you learn so much about the time period, um, partially because he had such a heterogeneous and incredible life. He was the first African American to pass the bar in the state of Florida and become a lawyer. He was the principal of a high school. He was a high school teacher. He was the first African American professor at NYU. He was the first black secretary of the NAACP. He served as foreign ambassador to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. He was a poet, a novelist, an editor, a historian, and a composer of musical theater. He really makes you kind of feel lazy, actually, when you read the whole thing. Um, his political career and his artistic career throughout his life were intrinsically linked, which is why he's such an interesting figure for someone like me to study. Um, the first thing that he did when he was appointed secretary of the NAACP in 1916 was undertake a massive study of lynching in the United States. And he and his partner, Walter White, set out to find answers to questions that nobody really knew the answers to, which were um, how many people were being lynched. These were crimes that were hardly ever reported. Um, they were hardly ever prosecuted. And why were they being lynched? What were the reasons for their, their being lynched? This is a map that they produced as a part of that study, which was the first map to represent how many lynchings took place in each of these states in the years between 1889 and 1918. Their methods in obtaining this information are really interesting. Um, I could talk about them more in the Q&A if you want, but they would often take with them um, NAACP secretaries who were either white or who appeared white, and they would infiltrate a town and get to know people and talk to people and they would find out the histories of these crimes. Um, and they would not count a lynching until it was really substantiated. Um, the other thing that they set out to prove in this study was to kind of disabuse the country of a very popular myth, which was not true. And that myth was that the reason why people were lynched was because they were men and because they had raped white women. What they found when they undertook this study was that was almost never true. That that was a, a fabrication that was created after the fact in order to justify this um, violent occurrence. So what you see um, on the left is the volume that Johnson and his team produced as a result of this study called 30 Years of Lynching in the United States. Um, this was published in 1919, but it was also made available in newspapers earlier than that. Um, and then what you see on the right is an advertisement that the NAACP took out in national papers across the country, um, publishing the sort of bare bones facts of this study. Why did they do this? Um, part of the reason, the, the greatest reason, was that they were trying to get an anti-lynching bill passed in the federal government. Because with, on the level of the states, lynchings were crimes that were almost never punished. They felt that there needed to be a federal law um, that would make sure that the victims of mob violence such as this saw justice. Um, this is one of the things, one of the major things that Johnson did uh, working on his political career. Another thing that he did was um, shortly after he completed the lynching study, in May of 1917, there was a parade uh, in St. Louis that quickly turned into a riot. Um, and the parade was supposed to be a protest of black non-union strike breakers in the packing industry. Um, but it became violent and it resulted in the death of at least 40 African American bystanders and the destruction of at least $400,000 worth of black property. Uh, so the NAACP wanted to stage a response and they had a meeting to think about how could we stage a response, what's the best thing to do? And Johnson came up with the idea. They started a parade that turned into violence Let's have a nonviolent parade. In fact, let's have a silent parade. And he came up with this idea for the silent protest parade, which happened a month after the riots. Um, this is the streets of Midtown Manhattan. 8,000 African Americans, men, women, and children marched in complete silence. Not a word was spoken. Um, Johnson designed all of the placards that they carried that had slogans ranging from, as you see, a man was lynched yesterday, to statistics, um, 
for, that they had compiled from the lynching report that he'd undertaken, to uh, children carrying signs that said, mother, treat me so that I may love my country. Um, it was very moving. There is a lot of evidence of people crying in the streets as they watched it. Um, and there was zero violence associated with this demonstration. This parade did not get a lot of historical attention for a long time. Um, a few recent books have come out paying attention to it, and it has been cited as the birth of the nonviolent protest movement um, and the creation of a lot of the aesthetics of contemporary political protest that we see today. Um, he had another job for the NAACP. So in addition to doing the lynching research, um, he and his partner Walter White, who also worked on the lynching project with him, um, were appointed by W.E.B. Du Bois to uh, serve as the cultural arm of the NAACP. And their mandate in that capacity was twofold. So the one thing that they were supposed to do was support African American artists and writers who are going to produce new and original work that was going to portray the race in a positive light. And the other thing that they were going to do was to protest um, films and other cultural products that portrayed African Americans in a negative light or continued to perpetuate these harmful stereotypes such as um, that black men were raping white women, which led to so much violence across the country. One of the first things that they really worked hard to protest was the silent film, The Birth of a Nation, um, which was released in 1915, was an incredibly popular movie, um, glorifying the KKK, and um, in particular centering around the plot of uh, an African-American man who sexually threatens a white woman. Um, Johnson was on board with protesting these kinds of works. He did have disagreements with organization co-founder W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who's not like the French pronunciation Du Bois, nor is he like the Wyoming pronunciation Du Bois. So you have to kind of meet somewhere in between. Um, du Bois took a really hard line after um, Birth of a Nation. And basically what he said is if they are going, if they, you know, the, the uh, racists basically, are going to produce art that is going to create circumstances of violence for us, African Americans, then we need to only produce art that is going to fight that. We need to produce art that is going to spread the most positive images of African Americans possible. Um, and he said this outright, all art is propaganda, all art is propaganda, and ever must be, despite the wailing of the purists. I do not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda. Johnson disagreed with him. So, Johnson didn't feel that all art should be propaganda, and he didn't feel that we should limit African American writers by saying, um, you know, you can only produce certain kinds of images of black people in your work. He thought that artists should be given artistic license, free reign, and that if the quality of the art itself were good, that would be the best advocacy for African Americans. The, art, the, artist who produ the artist produces his best when working at his best with the materials he knows best. Now, as I suggested, um, Johnson felt that African American artists and uh, actually also white artists who are producing work about African Americans um, should have artistic license, but at the same time he, he was behind the mission of protesting um, cultural products that produced African American, that produced images of African Americans that were overtly racist. So the, the main example of this was obviously minstrelsy. Um, and Johnson actually saw uh, minstrelsy, which was an incredibly popular form of entertainment in this country um, throughout the 19th century, as being the most destructive aspect of American culture as so far as um, creating racist ideas goes. So he thought that minstrelsy was behind much of the racism that he experienced. Um, he wrote, Stereotypes have, for the greater part, been molded by what may be termed literary and artistic processes. Some of the most persistent of these were formed on the minstrel stage. For nearly three quarters of a century, black-faced minstrelsy was the chief and most popular form of American entertainment. Hardly a hamlet in the country was too small to be visited by a minstrel show. And it was from the minstrel show that millions of white Americans got their conception of Negro character. Now. Just as these stereotypes were molded and circulated and perpetuated by literary and artistic processes, they must be broken up and replaced through similar means. 
No other means can be as fully effective. Some of this work has already been done, but the greater portion remains to be done, and by Negro writers and artists. So what's significant about this is he feels that his artistic work is perhaps going to have a greater effect than his political work in the sense that because the stereotypes are created through art, so too must they be destroyed through art. He wrote about this explicitly. I promise these are the only two long quotes I'll read. Um, saying, a number of approaches to the heart of the race problem have been tried. Religious, educational, political, industrial, ethical, economic, sociological. He tried most of them himself, actually. Along several of these approaches, considerable progress has been made. Today, a newer approach is being tried, an approach which discards most of the older methods. It requires a minimum of pleas or propaganda or philanthropy. It depends more upon what the Negro himself does than upon what someone does for him. It is the approach along the lines of intellectual and artistic achievement by Negroes and may be called the art approach to the Negro problem. This method of approaching a solution of the race question has the advantage of affording a great and rapid progress with least friction and of providing a common platform upon which most people are willing to stand. The results of this method seem to carry a high degree of finality to be the thing itself that was to be demonstrated. So, What's interesting about this is that it's precisely because he held this belief that Johnson is considered one of the less significant figures of the Harlem Renaissance by most scholars. One of my favorite quotes dismissing Johnson is from a scholar who calls him a stilted, aesthetic aristocrat. And most people say, you know, he was too focused on art, he was not political enough. My argument in my work is that his focus on art itself was extremely political. Um, this is intervening in some debates that are going on between contemporary literary critics. Um, these are two books that came out in 2011. Um, the scholar on the left, Gene Andrew Jarrett, um, he is much more charitable towards Johnson, and he suggests the view that African American literature um, needs to be thought of as a literary and cultural tradition outside of its political aims, and that we need to invent new ways of thinking of the category of African American literature that don't solely rely on it as a form of race protest. Um, Ken Warren, on the right, uh, holds a different view. As you can see by his provocative title, What Was African American Literature? He argues that African American literature is a historical phenomenon that no longer exists, that the genre that we call African American literature is what he calls a Jim Crow phenomenon, meaning it's specifically tied to how it protested um, Jim Crow era race policies. So he's taking Du Bois's notion of literature as propaganda, as protest, and saying that's what African American literature was, it's over, we don't need it to serve that function anymore, and now we just have literature writ large. How do we think about it uh, in general? How do we teach it? How do we historicize it? So I just pulled this image off of the internet. I think it's pretty evocative of the way that we think about African American literature, a study of culture and diversity. So we think about including African American literature in our curriculum so that we can learn more about African American lives. That seems problematic to me. Why? Well, it reminds me of the slave narrative problem, where if you think about the literature as being primarily about the experiences, the lives of the people who it's about, then you begin to discount it as an art form, um, as a cultural product, as something that people created out of their own creativity and ingenuity, not just their lived experience. Johnson thought this too. I got the idea from him, although he was a little bit more subtle about it. Um, this is the only novel that he ever wrote. Don't confuse it with his actual autobiography because it's not true. Uh, it's a novel called The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. Um, it's about a young man who grows up not thinking about race, and then when he's in about junior high school, he realizes that he's black because somebody calls him the N-word. Um, and then he comes to see that life is defined by this color line um, through which people are categorized by the color of their skin. The reason why he's so late in coming to this idea is because by all appearances, he looks like a white man. His uh, parents are both mixed race, and he's inherited many more of the white characteristics. He has blue eyes, he has blonde hair, he has relatively fair skin. 
So as he grows up, he's given the opportunity to decide, does he want to live life as an African-American man, or does he want to live life as a white man? Um, and that's why in this charming 1948 Pelican edition, they give you the subtitle that Johnson himself did not write, A Vivid Story of a Negro Who Crossed the Color Line. I don't love this subtitle because I think that the entire plot of the novel is not a plot of passing as the um, convention of oh, a black person choosing to live as white um, and letting everyone assume that they're white. Um, this is a topic that comes up in the literature of the period a lot. Um, so people think about this as a passing novel. I don't really think about it so much as a passing novel because I think that Johnson wrote it more as a cultural parable. I think that for him, the narrator, who never has a name, he's just known as the ex-colored man, is like the nation itself, both black and white, not either thing. Um, and his struggle over choosing shows that that choice is itself a kind of broken one, that you shouldn't have to decide, am I black or am I white? Um, that America shouldn't have to decide whether it has a white culture or a black culture, that it's always going to be both. Again, I think that Johnson was referencing the problem of the slave narrative when he wrote this book, which is a fictional autobiography. When he first published it, it was published anonymously, and he never said a novel. So it would, to, by all readers, seem to be what he called a human document, um, just a true story of somebody's life. But you don't know, is this person white or black? If I saw them on the street, would I know if they were white or black? And you don't know who wrote it. Um, Again, that references the problem of the slave narrative. So these are two frontispieces to slave narratives. Uh, that's like when you open the book, it's what's facing the title page. And this is a convention of the slave narrative. They always had a picture of the author and then the author's signature in his or her own handwriting. Why do you think they had that? Can anybody guess? Any a wild guess. So you could see the person who wrote the book? Yeah. You want to know what they look like? Why do you want to see their handwriting? Exactly. You want to know that they can write. So Frederick Douglass, if you haven't read uh, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, it is beautifully written. He's a wonderful writer. Um, and this was widely recognized. And in fact, when he went on his speaking tours across the country, People did not believe that he'd actually written the book because he was black, and they didn't think that a black person would be capable of writing. So um, when he proved, obviously, that he had written it, um, when he spoke eloquently, then people said, I don't believe you were ever a slave if you're so eloquent and articulate and you write like that. And then he would take off his jacket, and he would take off his shirt, and he would turn his back to the audience and show them the scars on his back. Um, and the reason why they had these frontispieces is so that people could look into the face of an African-American and also see that they could write. So doubtful were they of African-American literary prowess. Um, when Johnson wrote his autobiography of an ex-colored man, he also wrote his own preface. So instead of having the, the format where it's a slave writing their life story and then a white editor writing the preface saying, I know this slave, I know that it's true, um, he really did write this, I helped a little bit. Um, he writes his own preface, and instead of authenticating the text by saying this was really written by a black person, this was really written by a slave, I promise you this is all true, he confuses that and deliberately makes it um, unclear what the genesis of this text is. And beyond that, he also suggests that maybe when you walk it out into the street, you don't know who's black and who's white. He says, these pages reveal the unsuspected fact that prejudice against the Negro is exerting a pressure, which in New York and other large cities where the opportunity is open, is actually and constantly forcing an unascertainable number of fair complexion colored people over into the white race. So he's raising the suspicion that people who you encounter in the street and you think might be white might actually be black. Now, the other interesting thing about the narrator, the ex-colored man, in the autobiography of an ex-colored man, is that he's a really talented pianist. Um, and what he typically plays is ragtime music, which is a form that's associated with African Americans. Um, but 
as he goes and travels, and sometimes he lives as a white man, sometimes he lives as a black man, he performs to audiences both black and white, he also learns classical pieces. Um, he's a really talented pianist by all accounts. There's one scene where um, he takes this journey across Europe with this white millionaire who hires him as his personal musician to impress his European friends and, and have them play for him. And he sits down at the piano and he plays a ragtime piece. And in the middle of playing it, this big, bushy-haired German man comes over and says, get up, get up, and he seats himself at the piano. And he takes the exact same theme of the ragtime that the ex-colored man was playing, and he starts to play it in many different kinds of musical forms. So he, he plays it as a classical piece. Um, he plays it um, as other kinds of genres that are more recognizable maybe to the listeners, but also are associated both with white culture and with high culture, whereas ragtime was associated with black culture and like a lower, more popular culture. Um, and then the narrator says, it could be done, why can't I do it? And he s envisions this project where he is going to take um, African American music and reinterpret its forms so that people recognize it as the great artistic tradition that it is. A lot of literary critics see this scene as evidence of cultural appropriation. And they say that this is Johnson arguing that um, here's what white people do. They take African American cultural products and they turn them uh, into, they make them more white seeming and then they take credit for them. And to some extent, I think that Johnson did think that that was a problem, but I don't agree with that reading of this particular part of the novel, nor with that reading of the novel as a whole, because I think in general, Johnson was really supportive of creative reworkings of um, African-American forms, so long as people recognized that that's where those forms were coming from. And in fact, just in the same way that minstrelsy created this negative impression of African-Americans um, by white people donning blackface and um, parroting cultural stereotypes, um, I think that he thought that there was a positive version of that, where if white people adopted African-American forms as their own and recognized them as such, they would come to value and appreciate African-American contributions to American culture as a whole. Um, this is borne out by other passages in the novel uh, where he talks about how ragtime is an amazing American invention and people across the entire world love and appreciate it. And this is also uh, informs how I read the ending of the novel. So what happens at the ending of the novel is the ex-colored man finally decides that he wants to just live as a white man. Um, he's sick of race prejudice. He witnesses a lynching and it's devastating to him, obviously. Um, and he, he's too scared to continue to live in America as a black man. So he um, gives up his musical career. He gives up this dream and ambition that he had of informing the world about uh, African-American music. And he says, um, I cannot repress the thought that after all, I have chosen the lesser part, that I have sold my birthright for a mess of pottage. He's obviously referencing the biblical story um, of Jacob and Esau, where um, the birthright in this case is the rich heritage of African-American culture. And the pottage is the privilege and ease of living in the world as a white man. This is not something that Johnson did in his, in his own life. I mean, first off, Johnson could not have passed. He was visibly a very African-American man. But also, he continued in this mission, even though the anti-lynching bill that he worked so hard to get passed was never passed, ever. Um, he continued to work in the cultural sphere. So he collected um, Negro spirituals. Um, and African-American traditional poetry, uh, writing uh, very long and eloquent um, prefaces to these volumes um, and trying to spread the gospel of the, contribu the cultural contributions of African-Americans. Um, he also, in his autobiography Along This Way, talks about how his brother, um, the composer Rosamond Johnson, and his musical partner Bob Cole um, had a very influential act which was, and this is what Johnson says in his biography, the act that started a vogue of acts consisting of two men in dress suits and a piano. And I sort of latched onto this statement because I thought, how could that possibly be true? I mean, you see that everywhere. But this is exactly Johnson's point. Uh, the work that he did, uh, that is artistic work, but I would argue also political work, was to make us see just how pervasive the influence of African Americans is in every aspect of our contemporary culture. So, I traced the history of this forum, and it turns out 
that Johnson was indeed right. Um, Rosamond Johnson, his brother, and Bob Cole were the act that started the vogue of two men dancing in dress suits with a piano, which is called a class act. Mm. He actually was really influential in creating their routine. That's him in the middle with um, Rosamond and Bob Cole. And their act was a lot like what he talks about in Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, where they would go seamlessly from genre to genre and play classical music and play ragtime and play jazz um, and play gospel songs, all while wearing suits and looking very professional, um, in the same way of saying uh, African-American culture is a part of all of these different forms um, and can stand equally among them. This form took off hugely. Um, so here's Buck and Bubbles, other practitioners of the class act form. The reason why Johnson and Cole invented this form is because they were early performers on the vaudeville stage. And on the vaudeville stage, they had a rule, which was called the two-colored rule. And that was that you could not have one African-American performer standing on the stage by his or herself. Why do you think they didn't want that? Yeah, they didn't want an individual to become super famous or super powerful, and they thought that if you had one individual alone on the stage, then that would grant them too much authority. So Johnson and Cole came up with this idea that instead of um, just one of them performing, they would perform the exact same thing and dance um, in synchrony. And that's the form that really took off. So after Buck and Bubbles, you have the Nichols brothers who popularized this in the 1930s. And pretty soon after, even though this was created as a race, uh, it's an art form that was created in response to a racist rule, you started to have all sorts of white performers adopting it. So here's Doyle and Nixon in 1935 doing a classic class act routine. Before you know it, it's in popular mainstream film. This is Top Hat um, with Fred Astaire in 1935. They have multiplied. <laughs> now you have him with Gene Kelly in Zigfield Follies in 1946. Um, as I looked further and further into this, I saw that its reach was quite wide. So um, one of the first people to break the two-colored rule was um, the performer Bill Robinson, who you might also know as Bo Jangles. Um, and he performed at the Cotton Club alongside many of these other performers I've just shown to you. Um, Bernice Robinson, who you see on the left, was a dancer at the Cotton Club. And she... Um, Let me just get this right. She had a dance school. I just found this out about like three weeks ago. She had a dance school um, in Queens from 1949 to 2000. And one of her students was this really awesome looking guy on the right, Michael Peters. Um, you probably don't recognize him, but he was the choreographer of Michael Jackson's Thriller video. This is um, second from the right. That is Bernice Robinson. Oh, sorry, third from the right. That's Bernice Robinson. That's the Olympian, Jesse Owens. That's Bill Robinson. They're at the Cotton Club, all dancing together. This is um, the Cotton Club, a venue where the class act was performed regularly. This is Thriller. What are these zombies wearing? Not Michael Jackson, but the zombies. Not the women. <laughs> They're wearing suits. Uh, you also see it in this video for Janelle Monet, Tightrope. Justin Timberlake does class act routines. Twins, P-square. Um, here's Bill Robinson. Johnson loved talking about Bill Robinson. He talked a lot about, um, and when I say talked, Johnson both wrote about and also gave addresses about contributions to African American culture all over the country. Um, he gave many presentations about Bill Robinson and, and always talked about his work as a performer, never talked about his work with Shirley Temple ever. Instead preferred to talk about him as the teacher of the Roxy Dancing Girls. He taught them the class act routine. So when we think about Bill Robinson and Johnson's frame as the genius behind a performance at Radio City Music Hall rather than um, a stereotypical minstrel character performing alongside Shirley Temple, you begin to see a totally different view of how to understand African American culture in the context of American culture. Um, and the ways in which African Americans have influenced mainstream American culture, British culture, is huge and does not get enough recognition. 
Um, this is Muddy Waters, who influenced almost all of the music of the Rolling Stones with Mick Jagger. Um, that's all that I'm going to say right now. I'd really, really want to hear your guys' thoughts and, and any questions you have for me. And, and thank you so much for letting me talk about this with you tonight. If you have any questions, please address them. Yeah. Yes. I'm just wondering how. I don't picture that happening today, the silent protest march. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just looks to me like it would have turned into a racist riot that there would have been whites attacking those folks. Do you have any feel? Were there police there? there yes, so the, uh, the police were not protecting them. Um, the reason why I think it didn't turn violent is, again, for artistic reasons. So I think that Johnson was first and foremost an artist. I think he put a lot of thought into how to set up the parade. I think that the decision to have it be completely silent made it very difficult to assault people. Um, because they were so obviously being peaceful. He had everybody dressed up in formal clothes as if they were going to church. Um, and the parade was led by children. So he had children marching first, women marching second, and men marching behind. I think that all of these aesthetic decisions about the parade created a mood and a response that prevented violence. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think that's why when people talk about their first-hand experience of seeing the parade, they write of their breath leaving their body, um, tears pouring down their face, that nobody had ever seen anything like it. And I think that's why it's, it's to me, a really good example of how art informs politics, that um, if you just had a straightforward political demonstration without any thought to aesthetics, it would have been a very different and perhaps, you're right, deadly outcome. So one of my favorite movies is, of course, the Blues Brothers. Mm. Uh, which is a lot of blues and black blues and even has some scat in it. Yeah. But of course, uh, Jake and Elwood must, I now recognize, be doing the class act in front of their band, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very odd way of, I don't know if I have to rethink the movie. <laughs> right. Well, so I, I mean, I think that's what Johnson wanted us to do. So what's really um, interesting and significant about Johnson's ideas to me is that he was not against this idea of white performers adopting black forms. He was really for it. He just felt that in order for it to have the positive impact um, that he believed it could have, we needed to do this work of recognizing where those forms originated. That's why arts education is so important. All right, thank you guys so much.